Those who love wisdom must investigate many things. Heraclitus Good evening again. Uh, feels late, but it's actually pretty early and early. It's 11.36 p.m. apparently. Okay, so um, let's get on with it. <clears throat> um, again, uh, you can donate via Bitcoin or Vertcoin. Uh, Zero dollars as of yet via cryptocurrency. You know, it'd be nice to have someone just donate just a little, 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 just so that I know that that's working. <laughs> <laughs> over 16 months uh, and you can see that there's uh, zero I've uh, took money out of my patreon when I ended it gave it to Susie Dawson nothing for Vertcoin yet um, so there have been people who have uh, donated via super chat through Google um, but if you don't want to do that and would rather do it through people that me that would be actually better for me since Google doesn't take a big chunk out of it in the beginning of the first uh, the first video of the month, which I did two and a half hours ago, um, I did a thank you and it disclosed how much I made for that month and in total uh, since it was the first month, whatever. Okay, uh, now I can move on to what I want to move on to. Okay, here we go. Um, this is Marco Sugru, the Plato, Socrates, and the Dialogues Part 2 audiobook. Uh, this is four and a half hours into the audiobook. It's part 15 and 16, which is uh, the Platonic Achievement and the Living Voice. And um, it's about an hour and 40 minutes, about. Um, and then there's just a lot to go over because it's just so much stuff that you would not think you would have kind of piece together uh, i'm glad the professor is able to uh, piece it together and you know we can always go and verify the source but then there's also things that he says on the end which is awesome <laughs> what he says at the end of his of his lecture series is um has got to be probably one of my favorite uh endings of any lecture and um you'll see why and if you want to come on and talk about it afterwards in about 90 minutes or 100 minutes sorry um please be around um the information to join zoom is on the description box i'm sorry not in the description box yeah in the description box what am i talking about youtube in uh, vim.tv or steam it okay i'll shut up now listen for this is gonna be good for the next 100 minutes take some notes if you want and uh, we'll talk about it later Lecture 15, The Platonic Achievement. In summing up and reviewing the Platonic Dialogues, it's hard to do justice to the tremendous achievement that Plato presents us with. And usually when we think about Plato, brings to mind, uh, Whitehead's dictum that all of Western philosophy is footnotes to Plato, and there's a considerable amount of truth to that. It is certainly the origin of Western speculation. It's an attempt to give an account of the entire cosmos and of all the subsections within the cosmos, and it doesn't ignore myth, and it doesn't ignore logic, and it doesn't ignore any element in the philosophical enterprise. So I think it's fair to say that Plato is the origin of Western speculation. And if someone were inclined, as I am not inclined to do, to give you a, a short synopsis of Western philosophy, it would not be difficult to show that Plato is ubiquitous. It's pervasive. It's everywhere. Certainly, Augustine and the Middle Ages and German idealism are greatly indebted to Plato. But I want to look at it in a different way, a way that's not usually done. And perhaps it's a, a 
illuminating in a different sort of a sense. I want to look at Plato as the finish or the end the, of a particular intellectual tradition rather than the beginning. It's of course true that Plato is the beginning of Western speculation, but Plato also represents a kind of end point of an archaic intellectual and religious and political tradition. And in some respects, his greatest achievement is to finish off that tradition, to be the high point of that sort of a tradition. Remember that in Egypt and Mesopotamia and in western India, there are three river valley civilizations at the Nile, the Tigris, Euphrates, and the Indus River that have had civilized life, that have had organized uh, economic, uh, economic interaction, that have had uh, uh, elaborate theologies, highly stratified hierarchical societies that are all bound up under the same theological account of the world. In other words, in the Egyptian case, there are um, myths which account for why it is that the pharaoh is divine. In the case of Mesopotamia, there's something like the Gilgamesh epic, which explains why it is that the particular political and moral order that they have in Mesopotamia is sanctioned by the gods. And doubtless there's something similar for the cities in Mohenjo-Daro in the Indus River Valley as well. And it's known that these three river valley civilizations, which apart from China are the earliest and most important advances that human beings make out of hunting and gathering, they develop a whole tradition unto themselves. And what are the River Valley civilizations like? Well, they're static. I mean, they don't change very much. In many histories of ancient Egypt, they talk about Egypt's immobilism. We get one generation after another with one pharaoh after another. And maybe the names of the dynasties change, but fundamentally, the kind of life that people, people pursue is essentially identical generation after generation. A similar sort of thing happens in Mesopotamia and in India as well. The point is, that when we look at Plato, you can see a longing in his writings for that ancient archaic stability, that gesture of permanence which Greece does not have. Greece is a place of innovation, a place of change. It's constantly in flux. And what Plato is doing is looking back in a sort of longing way towards that perfect stability, that harmony between theology and politics and ethics, that unification of personal life and private life under the aegis of some myth. And in the case of Plato, he wants to reinforce the myth and ground the myth in logos, in logic, in reason. So what Plato is, in some respects, is a backward-looking, conservative thinker. And when I say backward-looking, I mean backward in time, not in the sense of retrogression, but rather he's looking back towards Egypt. If you think of something like the laws or in his other discussions of Egypt, Egypt is his ideal of stability and permanence. When he talks about his, the, the, in the, the laws, his final dialogue, the city that doesn't change is the good city and innovation is bad once you get a good system running. Well, Egypt, his, his idea of a city that stays where, uh, of a kind of culture that stays where it is. And Plato is trying to create that for us in the Greek context. So, Plato's longing for permanence and for stability is reflected in his political theory and also in his ontology. He doesn't like the world of tables and chairs, of space and time. He wants us to direct our thoughts upward towards things that don't change, the form of the good, the form of the beautiful, the form of the triangle and the square. Squareness stays the way it is. Blessed release from this world of flux and becoming. So I think that there's a tremendous influence that the river valley civilizations of Egypt and Mesopotamia give to Platonism. In other words, he's a kind of syncretistic attempt to bring together those traditions with other traditions. A second tradition that I think is very important is the borrowing, not just in Plato's case, but also in the case of Parmenides and Pythagoras, borrowing of certain Orphic uh, elements which ultimately I think come from India. I think that they're Vedic wisdom. The idea of reincarnation. You don't find much of that in Greece itself. You don't find much of that in the Doric tradition. You get these circle myths, these myths of circular time, of the giant cycle of the cosmos, the cycle of life, birth, death, repetition, judgment and action. Um, these circular myths, these myths of circular time and the circle of human life, I think are borrowed from the River Valley civilizations. Okay? As far away as India, certainly this reincarnation idea is an Indian thought. All right? That seems pretty clearly taken in that way. Plato would be very much at home in Egypt of the earliest dynasties. In other words, even though Plato is writing these between, say, 350 and 400 BC, even then this is archaic. In other words, Plato could have easily dropped his political theory back from, say, uh, Greece in, three, in 370 BC back to uh, Egypt 
in um, 2500 BC or Mesopotamia in 3000 BC and he would have felt right at home. He wants that permanence, that stability, that archaic longing for perfection in city and in soul. So uh, in some ways Plato is a is an, an improved version of the Gilgamesh epic, the most o old and ancient and stable and mythological kind of borrowing from the ri River Valley civilizations to which is added this characteristically Greek logos, this emphasis on reason and rationality that s doesn't supersede but reinforces the myths that are derived from the RVCs. So what we get are borrowings from India, borrowings from Mesopotamia, borrowings from Egypt, and what he brings to that is a new set of ideas that have been generated in the Mediterranean basin. The idea of an extended knowledge that goes beyond myth, beyond poetry, beyond mere rhetoric, towards some final, real, logical knowledge. And that means that we're going to have the unleashing of human rational capacities merged with these myths which long for or gesture at permanence and stability. I think it's true in his political theory because the good city doesn't change no matter what city it is, whether it's the city of the republic or the city of laws. And also real objects of knowledge, squares and triangles in the form of a good, stay the way they are. There's a longing for permanence and change here. Now what Plato is trying to do is to reconstitute Greek religion. He's trying to offer us a way of going back towards real knowledge and real moral order in the face of the fact that this archaic Greek religion is, has been broken up. What broke up Greek religion and what threatens all of Greek society with a kind of centrifugal force that's going to atomize all people and all uh, nations or all the city-states of Greece is the fact that Ionian physics, this materialistic, naturalistic, mechanistic physics, has given us an ateleological universe, a universe without gods, without divinity, without purpose, without natural function. And what that does is open the door to sophistry, open the door to clever men that have learned how to talk but, not, but have not learned how to think. In other words, the change in the conception of physics has undermined the myths that held Greek society together in the same way that myths held Egypt or Mesopotamia or ancient India together. They, alas, didn't have to deal with this mechanistic Ionian physics, so they managed to perpetuate themselves century in, century out, generation after generation. They continue onward, whereas Greece has a a brief flowering when all kinds of art and science and liter literature is generated in a tremendous burst of creativity, but this creativity is ultimately destructive. What Plato wants to do is harness th this creativity, is to bring together mythos and logos, to create a new substitute for the Homeric religion, which is either evil or not taken seriously by the people that it, sh it, that it should benefit. So what he's going to do is create a new, higher and finer religion and Plato intends to be the new Homer, the new teacher of Greece. So what we're going to do, instead of having the Homeric gods, what we're going to do is have the forms, which are very much like the gods, except they don't have much in the way of personality. The form of bravery is different from the god Ares, because bravery is different from this martial kind of a figure, this super warrior. And the form of love, for example, is different from Aphrodite. So what we're going to get is a substitution, a depersonalization of the Homeric gods, and by depersonalizing the Homeric gods, depriving them of human frailties and human foibles, he will perfect the pantheon. So he has great aspirations. He intends to be a great artist, and he is. He intends to be a great philosopher, and he is. But he also intends to be a prophet. He also intends to be the reconstituting force in Greek religion. And what he hopes to do with this new religion, this new religion of reason, if you will, is to arrest these centrifugal forces and bring them together, bring us back into wholeness and unity and organization of the soul, and by implication, organization of the city. By organizing our psychic life, our moral life, we will also organize our political life. So he has tremendous aspirations. It is hard to, I mean, perhaps in some ways, Plato's greatest achievement is to actually have aspirations at this level. Who cares whether he actually achieves this? The idea of actually reconstituting the religion for your culture and being your culture's greatest artist and arguably the greatest intellectual force in this culture um, and to want to do all these things simultaneously in the same corpus is just extraordinary. I mean, it's it verges on megalomania. 
But the problem is, is that it's clear enough that Plato, Plato was not a megalomaniac. He was actually one of the great creative forces in any culture at any time. And the Platonic dialogues are one of the great treasures that any culture has ever offered to its descendants. It is something that is worth your reading and worth your appreciation. I, I will come back to that a little bit later, but it is a great treasure. Do not make any mistake about that. So we're going to have this new improved religion, new improved thought, new improved art, everything is going to be improved. And the late dialogues in particular, the dialogues that Plato wrote between roughly the ages of 65 and the ages of 80, are the ones which most clearly show the maturity of his thought and what he was driving at. The last of the dialogues is the laws. And the laws is, in some ways, a replication of the ancient river valley civilizations. This could just as easily be Nineveh, Right? It's a giant solar calendar, and we talk about the re revolutions of the seasons and the revolutions of the cosmos, and our society is a microcosm. Right? Literally, it's a small version of the cosmos. What Plato's City of the Laws is, is perhaps the last gasp of the ancient solar myths of the River Valley civilizations, because they worship the sun both in India and in Mesopotamia and in Egypt. It is a way of taking those myths, shaking out all the accidental, arbitrary personalities that have been attached to the sun god and turning it into the universal symbol of being, of goodness, of truth, of permanence, of reality with a capital R. So he is taking these myths but rehabilitating them, taking out all the accidental properties and offering us some new religion, something that is worthy of worship by people that have discovered an important new force, autonomous rationality. So Plato is playing the biggest possible intellectual game here. He is trying to bring it all together, and he is the final stage in the development of these ancient solar myths. Think about how important the image of the sun is in the Republic and in all of the dialogues. It's not an accident that he chooses that. The sun is unique. The sun is somehow life-giving. And all of his images of knowledge, all the metaphors, are ocular metaphors. You always see the truth. You always see the form of the good. Um, when someone is blind, it always indicates that they have some sort of moral ignorance. Um, when Socrates puts the cloak over his head in the Phaedrus, he is morally blind. Sight and blindness are metaphors that dovetail into light and darkness. So whenever you see either blindness or sight or light or darkness, underline it, something more is going on than you might immediately guess. So what we're going to have here is Plato as the new savior of Greece. Uh, Athens has lost the Peloponnesian Wars. There's lots of internal fighting. Um, sophists are corrupt and corrupting men. Things are getting progressively worse. Plato intends to arrest this slide downward towards nothing. By taking these archaic solar myths, that would have been popular and important around the time of Gilgamesh, 3000 BC or so, and saying, these are still relevant to us. These still have something to say to us. In some ways, Plato is as far removed in time from the origins of these myths that he's refurbishing, 25 centuries, as we are from Plato now. So that shows the, the great continuity of Plato. In other words, it's a mistake just to view him as being the origin of Western speculation that somehow jumps um, l uh, out of Zeus's head th the way uh, Athena does. It's not the way it works. In fact, he's the culmination of a intellectual tradition that goes on for many centuries prior to the development of this. He's a response to the breakup of that old mythological tradition, and he's trying to make this relevant to his day. And by doing so, he has, in some ways, made it relevant to all days. He has stepped out of space and time into the realm of the forms, and these things still speak to us, perhaps not with the same tone, perhaps not in the sa with the same emphasis, but he is still talking to us. This is a gesture at the living voice of inquiry, at a piety which can roll with the punches and deal with all the changes in history because there is some fixed reality independent of the flux and the change and the becoming. Now, speaking of permanence, of stasis, of fixed reality, there's been a, an argument among scholars as to the changes in Plato's thought over time and the kind of answers that he gives to the various kinds of questions. Do the questions remain the same? It seems to be very clear 
The questions don't remain the same. Plato, if, if the questions remain the same, if the eternal questions really are eternal, then we're wasting our time with philosophy. It's the point of asking a question that no one ever makes any progress on. It's stupid. No, of course the, that Plato changes the questions that he asks, and he also changes the answers that he gives. The point of Platonism is not that the questions and answers don't shift subtly over time and with circumstance, but rather that his main concerns remain the same over time. In other words, there are certain issues that he may question from different perspectives and in different ways, but he is still concerned with the same set of issues through all the changes that he undergoes in the course of a 50-year career. Remember, Plato dies at the age of 80. And every, anyone with any brains, especially someone that's as gifted as Plato, is going to change his mind over the course of time if he is intellectually honest. So, of course, it goes without saying that the Plato who is writing the laws is very different from the Plato who is writing the Apology. It's very different from the Plato of the middle period that's writing the Symposium and writing the, um, the Republic. So, naturally enough, his questions change, at least slightly. His answers change, sometimes quite radically, for example, when he gives up the philosopher king. But the issues that he is concerned with, I think, do not change. I think they're fundamentally the same. And there are at least two clusters of issues that I, I direct your attention towards. And the first is that Plato is interested in creating something like a harmony within the human soul. In other words, unhappiness, misery, ignorance, vice are all the same thing. They're all some sort of disease of the soul, an imbalance of the elements of the soul. And what you are supposed to get is a, literally a music, and here I'm not talking about sounds, but I'm talking about uh, something derived from the muses, a music orientation, all right, which allows you to harmonize the soul the way the strings of a lyre or a guitar are harmonized. And when you reach that situation of harmony, that is called wisdom or virtue, or blessedness. And Plato is gesturing at that, whatever it is. And perhaps our human language is insufficient to satisfactorily talk about virtue, or satisfactorily talk about perfection. He is gesturing at that, even if he can't articulate it. And no matter how his perspective changes over time, he is trying to create internal soul harmony, and then he uses that as a way of bootstrapping himself up into the harmony of the city. The city is like the man all through Plato. There's no, get, there's no question about that. He may be willing to reorganize or rethink or rearticulate that relationship, but there is some definite correspondence between the virtue of the souls, the wisdom of the individual souls making up a society, and the way in which that society meets its collective problems and organizes its collective political and social life. So the connection between the soul and the city, creating a harmony between the city and the man, and unifying politics and ethics is Plato, one of Plato's fundamental concerns. Ethical order, moral order, the connection and extrapolation from one to the other is always a main concern of Plato's. There's no, no matter how his thought changes over time, that never leaves us. Connected with that and... Uh, also related to a, a number of other themes is the idea of art. What is more artistic than the Platonic dialogues? They are so subtle and so beautiful and so deep. If you don't like these things and you've really read them, there is something wrong with you. And I, I'm, I, I'm not trying to be pejorative towards you. I mean, if you don't read this and you honestly don't like this, there's something wrong with you. I can't help you. I, I don't know how to talk to you. And, you know, I'm a historian, not a psychiatrist. I can't help you out. If you honestly read this stuff and you apply yourself to it and you really tell me that you don't find this beautiful or uplifting or spiritually ennobling, you have a problem. It is not a problem with Plato. Take my word for this. So you have to be able to extend yourself, but if you do extend yourself, the dialogues will repay you. They are the greatest achievement of Greek art and arguably one of the greatest artistic achievements in any culture at any time. So Plato is highly gifted as an artist. I mean, he starts out as a tragedian, and he's the most gifted pupil of Socrates. And he is prim he's largely concerned with the connection, not just between politics and ethics, but the connection between ethics and aesthetics. This is so very important when we read The Republic. In book three, he says some very unkind things about Homer. Now, we might, if we were kind of ill-spirited, suggests that there's a sort of professional vanity here. 
Plato's a very great poet, and so is Homer. And if Plato's going to supersede Homer as he intends, well then, perhaps he should criticize Homer relentlessly, which is what he does in all the dialogues. I mean, not just the Republic, but certainly Book Three of the Republic, he goes after Homer with hammer and tongs. Homer is a bad man. Homer is an ignorant man. Homer is an educator who miseducates the people who listen to, the, to, listens to him, and he makes them worse. He makes their souls, which were bad to begin with, even worse. So we're going to have to censor the poets in our good society. And even by the time of the laws, 30, 40, 50 years later, after he writes The Republic, we're still censoring the poets, and we're still not going to let Homer in unless he is a good boy. And it's very hard to get Homer to behave himself. And certainly, tragedy and comedy get the same sort of treatment. Tragedy is bad. Comedy is bad. Lyric is bad. All the kinds of poetry are bad. Why? Because they foster ignorance. Poetry is always viewed as being a didactic enterprise. You cannot separate poetry from education. And let me emphasize here that when poetry is referred to in the dialogues, he is not talking about sonnets and iams. He is talking about all artistic creation. So we mean painting. We mean sculpture. We mean architecture. We mean even the construction of constitutions and laws and cities. All artificial constructs are poems in Plato's sense. That's why the construction of the ideal state in the Republic of the Laws, that's a poem, and not just the actual physical document that you get. I mean, the ideal city of the laws is a poem in Plato's sense. It's a thing constructed. It's an artificial entity that doesn't exist in nature. Law becomes a sort of poetry, a mimesis of the good man doing good things. It's educative. That's why we have those preambles in the beginning of the laws. For each one of the laws, we explain to people why they should obey this law, why law is educative. Law is a kind of poetry. So for Plato, the domain of art is enormous. It's everything that isn't nature. Right? And it turns out to be even inclusive of nature, at least insofar as nature is encapsulized in our theory. Our theory of nature is also a poem. And the bad poems created by the Ionian physicists are poems that will also have to be censored. We're going to offer them a new poem. Plato thinks he can do better. That's the point of the Timaeus, another one of the late dialogues. He says, before I die, I want to make sure that you have an edifying poem about nature. Anybody can make up these poems about nature. Democritus does, and Empedocles does, and Anaxagoras does, and Thales does. But look, I'm going to make up a poem about nature. I can do all that mathematical, geometrical stuff about atomism and all that. But the key thing is, my poem about nature is going to be spiritually and morally good because I will have a teleological nature. The demiurge, God, will somehow be behind nature, investing it with meaning and purpose and moral order. And that's why my myth, my poem of nature is the best poem. And Plato didn't think very highly of this activity, the activity of constructing poems to nature. But when he does, he does it because he wants to finish out the project that he has set for himself of describing all of human experience, the entire cosmos. And merely because he disdains the world of space and time, he can't ignore it. So towards the end of his life, he says, OK, I'll write my poem to nature. And he says, this poem, like my other poems, should supersede the alternative rivals because the Ionian physicists are bad. The Ionian physicists are ignorant men that teach evil and vice in the same way that Homeric poets and tragic poets and comic poets and lyric poets all corrupt men. So Plato intends to supersede all of the physics of his society, which is a great ambition by itself. But he also intends to supersede all the moral theory and also all the political theory and also all the art work of every kind. So Plato's corpus is a gesture at all of human creation. What an amazing achievement. Even if he doesn't create satisfactory answers, just the desire to walk around the circle of knowledge, to talk about the perimeter of speech, to gesture at the limits of what the mind can do, to show an overlapping between cosmos and psyche, it's awesome. It's like looking at the Grand Canyon. If, you don't, if you're not impressed by this, there's something wrong with you. I, mean, I can't help you. It's not my fault. It's not Plato's. Take my word for this. This is wonderful and lustrous and beautiful. It does not corrupt over the ages. Just because we don't believe in Plato's physical theory doesn't mean that this is not a great achievement. 
the least important thing about Plato is the details. Some people, like Aristotle or, or several of my philosophical friends, believe that God is in the details, and perhaps he is. Perhaps it would be impious to deny that, but Plato says perhaps he is in the details, but he's certainly in the big picture, the large contours, and that's what Plato is really good for. And if it turns out that his theory of atom of atomic structure isn't the right one, that doesn't make any difference. Plato is gesturing at the authoritative and autonomous human capacity to reason. And if you reason out the problem and it turns out that his physical theory or his aesthetic theory or his moral theory needs to be fixed because there's something wrong with it, that doesn't undermine Plato. That confirms Plato. This has been made to be superseded, which means that it can't be superseded. All right? You don't become Socrates' disciple you don't become a true Platonist until you criticize Socrates and until you reject Plato. That's what he's trying to teach you. And that's why he has to cover every realm of human knowledge. What a tremendous achievement. All in the service of moral order. Well, let's go back to his, uh, to his aesthetic theory, because we have to think about that. Those of you who know Tolstoy, particularly a lovely little piece he wrote on aesthetics called uh, What is Art? Tolstoy makes an argument that all art is ultimately moral and that true aesthetics, true beauty, is always done in the service of educating the reader or the observer, the spectator, in moral truth. Art cannot be disjoined from morality. Plato is the real origin of that idea, and it may or may not be true. I'm often inclined to believe it. But this is an entire stance towards art. Art is always education, which means that the good man is the educator and the true poet is the educator. And true beauty is always morally good. So this is the origin of his idea of censorship in the city. Aesthetics is not autonomous. Aesthetics is not irrelevant to our political life. Actually, it is the way in which we educate people towards their moral and political obligations. This is what justifies his idea of censorship. But Plato is such a tasteful individual. I mean, this could easily d devolve into a kind of Philistine censorship that we get, say, under Stalin or any of the, the great tyrants. It would be a terrible thing to lose Greek architecture and Greek sculpture and Greek myth and Greek tragedy and Greek comedy and Greek epic because it's immoral. And Plato's analysis will show that all of these things teach you bad stuff. They make your soul worse. They make you ignorant and vicious. So what shall we do? Plato intends to supersede all of Greek poetry. As he says in the Republic, in our ideal city, in our, our city of wisdom, in which all of our art is unified under the, uh, um, the aegis of our political and moral theory, we will have to have only two kinds of poetry, and this is poetry in the extended sense. Hymns to the gods and the praises of good men. And everything else is either superfluous or wrong, and almost always dead wrong, and almost always a corrupting, bad influence on education. So what I want to suggest is that every one of Plato's dialogues must necessarily have been allowed into Plato's good city, because he wants to create non-corrupting art. And that means that if you think about it, all of the dialogues must be either hymns to the gods or the praises of good men. And that means that they are morally educative, that they have a pedagogic, didactic purpose, and that they are viewed, or that they are put together with the idea of unifying soul and city, making us better and more virtuous, not giving us mere aesthetic pleasure. Remember that pleasure is not the good, and pleasure is not virtue, and well, that means that we will give as much pleasure as is consistent with right and wrong. Let's think about what Plato's ambition is here. Lyric poetry, the poetry of powerful internal emotion, the power, uh, the uh, the divine poetry that we get from people like Sappho or Anacreon or Stesichorus, well, many of these powerful emotions lead us to do evil things. Almost everyone knows personally what it is like to do something under the force of great anger or great uh, lust or great uh, uh, desire of some kind. We certainly don't want to fan the flame of that desire. We don't want a poetry that teaches people that they should indulge their whims, even if it causes them to behave in an immoral way, even if it causes them to undermine the political order. We need a new kind of lyric poetry that will supersede all those other lyric poets. And you know where we're going to find that? In the Phaedrus. In other words, Plato intends to supersede all of Greek lyric poetry with this great hymn to love. 
He wants to show you what an orderly sort of soul will look like, and at the same time give you the greatest and most moving praise of love, far better than any other lyric poet did. Because as he says, the essence of good speech is knowing what you're talking about. So morally improving poetry is what he's doing here, and probably the most difficult genre in which to do that is the lyric poem. In the Timaeus, he showed us a sort of poem, a theory of nature, and in his sense of poetry, that is a poem. And what do we get there? We get a morally improving teleological conception of nature. Wraps that right up. So we have, finishes off natural science, finishes off political theory in the, in the sophist and the statesman and in the laws and in the republic. He covers ontology. He covers all possible disciplines. Plato is going to be the super poet. He's the new Stesichorus. Remember when we had the Stesichorus is the one who uh, covered his, who lost his sight because he gave a bad speech about Helen and then got it back when he gave a good speech? Well, Plato intends, intends to be the new improved Stesichorus that doesn't make any bad speeches initially. He's only going to go up, he's going to ratchet that up one level and says, fine, I can do that. I can write lyric poetry, be the best lyric poetry around, and I'll skip the bad part, the morally evil part that's going to make my listeners vicious. I'm just going to give them the good part. Morality is the supervisor of our aesthetic theory, ethics over poetics. But he's not finished with lyric. Let's think about epic. It is very clear that Plato intends to be the new Homer. The dialogues taken together have a journey motif that runs through them like a thread. We're always going somewhere, but we're never going anywhere. Socrates, remember, never leaves the city. He never goes and travels around like the other sophists do. Instead, he goes on a spiritual odyssey, not an odyssey of the body. It is very clear that Socrates is the new Odysseus and Plato is the new Homer, talking about the travels of Socrates. So that way, remember the beginning of the Republic? Down I went to Piraeus. There's a long journey over that few miles. Uh, think of the beginning of the Protagoras. Um, his interlocutor wakes up and says, get up, Socrates, we have to go over and meet Protagoras. We're on a journey again, but we can't go in immediately, so let's walk around the city until it's a decent hour for us to go there. The journey motif reasserts itself. In the, in the Credo, Credo comes and says, look, Socrates, we've got to bust you out of jail. Let's go to Thessaly, let's take off. He says, look, I've been on the journey of dialectic. That's from the sixth book of the Republic. And I think that I'll continue my journey by staying right where I am. All right, platonic irony and the journey motif. Actually, if I were to leave there, I would not be on my journey anymore. I can continue my journey by staying where I am. In addition, not only are we going to have this journey motif continuing through, but it continues right to the end of his life. If you remember that after Socrates drinks the hemlock in the Apology, what does he have to do? He has to walk around until it pumps through his body. That's the end of the journey. And there's this, look, nothing happens by accident in the Platonic dialogues. If Socrates walks, he walks for a reason. If he has a drink of something, he drinks for a reason. If it's red wine instead of white wine, there's a reason for it. So whenever you see somebody moving from some place to another, or journeying, or going somewhere in the dialogues, underline that too. And if you keep doing all the underlining that I've told you to do, eventually your book will look like mine. Three quarters of it will be underlined because that actually is the kind of care that you should give to this. Plato is the new Homer. Socrates is the new Odysseus. He's on a spiritual odyssey within the city. And those of you who doubt that you can have a spiritual odyssey within one city, I direct you to James Joyce, Ulysses, the idea of having a, an odyssey within one city, Dublin, within one day, much less one lifetime. The journeys of the soul are a lot more subtle than the journeys of the body. That's perhaps one of the great advantages of Plato over Homer. In addition, Socrates is also clearly the new Achilles. He's the new hero of virtue. And Plato is the new author of the new improved Iliad, the hero of knowledge, who is brave, but he knows what to be brave about. He doesn't have the wrath of Achilles. He doesn't have those evil qualities of soul. And like Odysseus, Socrates' hero is a, a, a superior man, but Odysseus is known for telling lies, for his ability to make up a, a plausible story and get what he wants. Socrates is known for telling the truth. He's the new improved version of the Achilles and the uh, Odysseus myth. Plato, in these dialogues, has written the new Odyssey and the new Iliad. And what's nice about this is that instead of Odysseus moving around the Mediterranean and visiting all these monsters, Socrates will stay in Athens and the monsters will come to him. That's what it means to meet Gorgias, to meet Protagoras, to meet Hippias, to meet any of these deformed souls. They are monstrous creatures. They are not fully human. And we haven't finished yet. There's still more poetry to go. 
Clearly, Plato is the new lyric poet, the, the final lyric poet of Athens, of Greece. He's also the new Homer, the final epic poet of Greece. But there's still tragedy and comedy. Now, it's very clear that Plato thinks that uh, the tragedians have a bad influence on the education of Athens. And if you will remember, the, the last passage in the symposium where Alcibiades shows up as Dionysus, well, here he is clearly taking a shot at Euripides. Euripides was the last of the three great tragedians, and what Euripides characteristically does is introduce irony and introduce moral disorder to his tragedies, which, of course, Plato thinks is a way of miseducating people and making them their souls vicious. Well, when Alcibiades shows up at the end of the Republic, or at the end of the Symposium, what, that, what Plato is gesturing at is the fact that Euripides typically resolves his lack of moral order and, and takes care of the conclusion of his tragedy by having a deus ex machina, by having a god, which no one really believes in anymore, come in and restore moral order. What Plato is saying is, well, yes, you're right. Just like the symposium says, the same man can write comedy and tragedy. But in fact, what I'm going to do is take the characteristic tragic conclusion of Euripides and lampoon them and make a joke out of it. It's clear that if I want to add the first part of the tragedy, I could do that too. Remember that Plato burned his tragedies when he became a Socratic. So, Plato here is gesturing at his disdain for Euripides, and of course, Euripides, the, the tragic poet that lives at the same time as Plato, is his paragon of the depraved poet who causes other people to become still more vicious. That's a degenerate kind of tragedy. Plato himself is going to be the new improved tragedian. He's going to offer us a new hero, Socrates, that is going to be, in some respects, like the the great tragic heroes of Aeschylus, the first of the tragedians. And Aeschylus is noteworthy for the fact that he maintains moral order in things like the Oristia, right? Socrates is going to be the new tragic hero, but he's going to be somewhat different because he's going to lack the tragic flaw. He doesn't have the hubris, the moral blindness that we find in Oedipus. He knows what he's doing. So we're going to have a new improved tragedy. And now go back and look at the Apology. He says at the end of his, when he's condemned, those of you who have condemned me, blood guilt be upon you, vengeance will come, uh, what comes around goes around. Think of the Oristia, think of the Furies, think of the moral order that we get in Aeschylus. Though, and Socrates says at the end when he's condemned, those of you who didn't condemn me, who don't understand my philosophy, who are willing to let me live, don't worry about it. I'm going someplace better than we have here. I'm not worried. You shouldn't worry. It's a catharsis of pity and fear. And that's what Aristotle tells us is, the function of the tragedy. That's what makes a tragedy tragic. You have to have that catharsis of pity and fear. Plato's decided that not only are we going to censor the poets, but it's not really a problem. There's no loss because his poetry is better. It does everything their poetry does, and it does it all in the same <laughs> corpus of work. So all of tragedy is superseded. We now have the real moral tragedy, representing a good man doing good things. And we have the real epic, the hero of the soul rather than the hero of the body. And we have the real lyric, the man whose love is for love of forms and love of souls, not mere physical love. So he superseded the main elements of Greek poetry. And the final element, comedy, is not to be overlooked because, as Plato says at the end of the symposium, the same poet can write comedy and tragedy. And, of course, there are so many funny things in the dialogues, and it's easy to overlook these things, because usually the dialogues are taught in a very solemn, serious way, and these are very serious, but they're at the same time very funny. I have emphasized throughout my lectures that there is no conflict between great playfulness and great seriousness. These are exceedingly funny, and there are lots of inside jokes for those of you that know the history of Greek culture and uh, Greek literature, and at the same time, the moral earnestness cannot be overlooked. Think about the Parmenides. Arguably the greatest high comedy ever written. Nearly unintelligible, it's a lampoon of ontology. Who can write a series of jokes about ontological problems, about the nature of being? Who would think that up and try and get away with it? Only Plato. Think of the Euthydemus, where we have these two dopey brothers who are making all these stupid arguments, and the stupider the two explains the argument to Socrates. You have to understand how funny that is. Now, he never descends to, you know, the kind of base or kind of a low comedy that we get at with Aristophanes, you know, the stupid slapstick stuff where, you know, it's like the three stooges, you poke him in the eye and you slap him in the head. He never does that. I mean, he maintains at least the middling level of comedy. But do not overlook that this is hilariously funny. And the way in which these comedies usually express themselves is through the vehicle called irony, saying one thing and meaning another. 
that there should be a mask or a shell on top of Socrates, because you wouldn't want people who are not suitable for philosophy to break through that mask. If you remember the uh, analogy that Alcibiades made in the symposium that he was like Marsyas the satyr, Marsyas the satyr was f tried to vie with Apollo for his capacity in music and as a result of losing to the gods he had his skin stripped off. The symbolism here is that Socrates' argument have a, has an external skin, a skin of irony, and you don't really find out what they are until you open them up. So you must be aware that there are all kinds of subtle jokes. Dramatic irony and jokes associated with that. Symbolic irony and jokes associated with that. And logical irony, which is perhaps the most difficult of high comic um, elements to introduce. So what we have here is the new improved comedy. And Plato is the new improved Aristophanes. He is an Aristophanes that is not a pig. He is an Aristophanes that has an organized moral soul. He is a writer of high comedy that appeals to the mind rather than low comedy that appeals to the eyes and appeals to people that don't have any understanding. This is comedy that improves the listener because it only makes fun of things that are truly ridiculous. Ignorance, stupidity, foolishness, and vice. It is comedy that is organized from a moral perspective. And this comedy is what holds or this, this divine comedy, which is what the Platonic dialogues are, is what, one of the things that holds all of them together. Now let's stop and review what he's done here. Plato is not only intending to censor all the poets and to get rid of all the immoral poetry that's being generated in Greece, Plato intends not only to, to leave a poetic vacuum there, he's going to fill that vacuum. He is the new epic poet. He is the new lyric poet, he is the new tragic poet, and he is the new comic poet. And he does it all in the same body of work and with one universal hero. It is the case that one man can write comedy and tragedy, and he might have said epic and lyric as well. And even more remarkable, even more explosive in its implications, the great achievement of Plato is that he invented a new universal hero for his new universal poetry. It's a hero of the soul, hero of knowledge, hero of wisdom. A man as enigmatic and as protean as the sort of art form which allows us to encounter him. This new hero is Socrates. A hero of knowledge as opposed to war. A hero of the soul as opposed to the body. A hero of morality as opposed to self-indulgence and hubris. He is the new ideal, which is going to supersede the Homeric ideal, which is going to supersede the tragic ideal, the comic ideal insofar as there is, is such a thing, and the lyric ideal. We are going to have a new autonomous hero of reason. And in the future, when we think of the Greeks, we will not be so inclined to think of Homer, or Stesichorus, or Aeschylus, or Aristophanes. When we think of the hero, we will think of the hero as a creator, Plato, and the hero as a creation, Socrates. And one of the most difficult and vexing problems in our interpretation of the dialogues is to separate the two. And my argument is that it's very hard to separate the artwork from the artist. It's very hard to separate the dancer from the dance. And it seems to me then that the greatest achievement of Plato is to have created this enigmatic figure, Socrates, that's a universal hero for a universal work of art. The Platonic Dialogues are all one work of art. I've just been giving you lectures on the individual chapters. And this universal art and this universal hero gestures at a universal beauty, a universal truth, and a universal virtue which would have gone unimagined by us poor mortals had we never been able to encounter this. This is the great achievement of Plato. He gestures at some final heroism for us. He gestures at it through mythos and through logos and shows that they are not antagonistic, that we can get them to fold together as a kind of necessary complement to each other. This complement, complementary relationship between the parts of reason and the parts of imagination allow us to glue together the disparate elements of our soul, and gluing together and bringing together the various elements of the soul allow us to unify the city. And the city, after all, is a microcosm of the universe. And it shows that the universe is unified, that the universe is divine, and that we have a glimpse of it when we see the perfect and superior platonic works of art.
Lecture 16, The Living Voice. In reviewing and summing up and evaluating the Platonic Dialogues, the most difficult problem is the problem of Socrates. Most of the great philosophers in the Western tradition have had to grapple with this problem because Socrates is the, the kind of fountainhead, the hero of Western speculation, the uh, authoritative voice of reason which tells us inquire and think and use your head. And yet, what lies behind the mask? What kind of a man is Socrates? What shall we think of this demonic hero of love and hero of knowledge? What are we to make of this after looking at all the dialogues? And unlike Plato, which is relatively straightforward, it's not so hard to get a, grap a grasp on Plato, distinguishing the construction Socrates or the historical Socrates from what we find in the dialogues is very difficult. So I'm not even going to try it. I'm going to say on the basis of the dialogues, what can we say about Socrates? What have we found out? Well, Socrates is interested in the problem of identity and we're interested in the problem of his identity. Who is Socrates? The beginning of the Gorgias and at the beginning of the uh, Protagoras, when Socrates grapples with these great sophists, he has himself or his student ask Gorgias and Protagoras, who are you? And what he's asking then is, what is your function? What, are you, what, what do you do in society? What is your, your particular purpose in life? And it's not clear what Socrates' purpose is. He talks in the Apology, he talks of himself as being a gadfly and as driving the you know, somnolent people towards virtue by uh, impressing upon them the limits of the, and the extent of their own ignorance. But in fact, it's got to be more than that because the difficulty with Socrates lies in the fact that he wears so many masks. How do we distinguish between the persona of Socrates and the man himself? Very, very difficult. Certainly as an object within the dialogues, as a new kind of hero, he is the universal hero of this universal kind of poetry. The lyrical lover of souls as opposed to bodies. He's the ideal lover. And he's the demon of love. He's the eudaimon, the eudaimonia of Athens. In other words, he is the happiness and the spirit of love within Athens. Um, as uh, an epic hero, he's the new hero of knowledge. He's the new, he's on the spiritual journey. That's all true. He's a, he's a kind of an epic figure, a larger than life creature. He's the new tra tragic hero without the tragic flaw. He's in particular though, and I would emphasize this, he's the new hero of humor. Socrates is a great comic hero. But there's a big difference in the kind of comedy we get in Socrates. Here we have not a human comedy as we saw in Aristophanes. What we get in Socrates and in the Platonic Dialogues as they represent Socrates is a divine comedy. A comedy which offers us a glimpse at something more, something higher. Instead of a comedy which points at human foibles, human depravity, it points beyond them towards something else. And this divine comedy that Socrates offers us means that he's a new and improved comic hero. And what will be connected with this is the fact that the dialogues are full of jokes, but the jokes are on the people that Socrates talks to. Socrates doesn't get fooled in the dialogues. No, Socrates is a sort of universal straight man. The joke is on everybody else. Note that in the dialogues, Socrates only laughs once over many hundreds of pages, talking to many different kinds of people, making all kinds of dramatic and symbolic and logical jokes. Socrates only laughs once. He's making jokes all the time, and other people laugh every once in a while, but the joke is inevitably on them. Socrates is one of the wittiest and most humorous of men, which is a very surprising characteristic in one of the great philosophical heroes of the Western tradition. He is in, living in his own comedy, but he's a straight man. The joke is on the people he talks to, and when we read the dialogues, the joke is on us. We should not make the mistake of thinking that because... Socrates is making jokes that he is lacking in moral seriousness, and we should also not make the mistake of thinking that Socrates is laughing at us merely with the intention of ridiculing us. All of the dialogues, all of art, all of Socrates' activities are intended to be educational, and we are supposed to get from Socrates a kind of moral education. That is what he is trying to show us. Kierkegaard, one of my favorite philosophers, 
was also a great admirer of Socrates. He wrote his doctoral dissertation on Socratic irony, and he was particularly interested in irony himself, and he's particularly interested in the state of the soul. And he, wrote a, he made a very interesting observation about Socrates once. He said that uh, all melancholic men have the best senses of humor, that for the funniest men are almost inevitably melancholy, and that one serves as a mask for the other. And I strongly suspect that that's the case at least when we consider Socrates. That is to say, Kierkegaard himself was quite ironic and had a wonderful sense of humor and was a decisively melancholic individual. And the fact that he should recognize that in Socrates suggests to me that Socrates was a highly melancholic individual. At least this is my Socrates. Reading it now again, you know, in the middle part of my life, I can't help but believe that behind this persistent good humor, this persistent drive towards improving himself and improving others, there is a dark side here. No, uh, perhaps it's true of all comedians, but the greatest of the comic heroes, Socrates, I think, has a persistent streak of melancholy. Kierkegaard, who knows himself and who knows irony and who has a wonderful sense of humor, perhaps senses a kindred spirit here. It also appears to me that Gorgias, remember when we talked about him during the dialogue by the same name, that Gorgias has a certain streak of melancholy and that is what drives him to the extreme of sophistry in the same way that Socrates dr is driven towards the extreme of philosophy, both being pursued by the, the demons of, of unhappiness both afraid, or if not afraid, both being pushed along towards their extreme path because nothing in this world is completely satisfactory to them. Uh, as uh, Alcibiades says of Socrates in, at the end of the symposium, he does not love the way we love. He does not love the things that we love. Um, if you think about the encomium on Socrates at the end of the symposium, Alcibiades says, he's not interested in sex the way we are. He's not interested in money. Look, he's never made any money. He's the smartest guy in Athens. At a time when Alcibiades was with him on a military campaign, Socrates showed great bravery and took care of Alcibiades, but then was disdainful of military decorations. and give them to Alcibiades, he would really like them. The idea is, is that Socrates cannot find in this world of space and time, in the things that most men pursue most of the time, does not find anything that satisfies him or gratifies him or makes him feel that this is worthy of him. Socrates' entire thought and his entire drive is towards something else, something higher, something superior. Remember that at the end, in the Phaedo, when Socrates is dying, he says, I expect two things to happen. One, I'm sure that I'm going to the gods, which is where he's all, perhaps always belonged. And two, with any luck, I will find up there good and virtuous men and women that have lived lives down here that were praiseworthy and that were divine, and then I'll be able to talk to them. And what, what will be most entertaining about heaven is that I'll meet more uh, people that are more interesting to talk to than the people I met down here. What a... It's, it's, you might almost think it was a bitter irony, but Socrates has no bitterness. What he is saying is that this world has been a great disappointment to him. And the people around him, he did his best with them, but they have disappointed him. And he doesn't hold that against him. He knows that all wrongdoing is involuntary. He knows that they don't mean to be ignorant or mean-spirited or cruel, but they are not what they could be. And the world around us is imperfect, is not what it could be. And it makes him long for a permanence and an excellence and a virtue that he does not find down here in the world of space and time. He is the true daemon of love, but this daemon has one foot in the world of space and time and one foot in the beyond somehow. And all his jokes seem to suggest that he's comparing the true world of unchanging reality, of perfect formality, with this world down here, and this world has been judged and found lacking. Many of his jokes suggest that he's in on the joke of the gods and that he realizes that the things that we pursue, that the things we take seriously, are not to be taken seriously. He wants to move us away from our pursuit of wealth or pleasure or power towards the pursuit of something divine. In some ways, Socrates is a joke played upon us by the gods. He has been sent down here, who clearly does not belong here, and that is why Socrates is always making jokes, jokes that we don't understand, jokes that the interlocutors don't understand. Whenever Socrates' interlocutors laugh, they're always laughing at their own jokes, or at something that seems foolish, but in fact, the times when they laugh are almost always inappropriate. In fact, Socrates is being serious, and people laugh at him, and then when he's being kind of jocular, when he's joking with people, people would take it with grim seriousness. This irony allows him to conceal his own superiority. 
In other words, irony, which is a kind of dissembling, which is very similar, perhaps the first cousin of telling a lie, right, really isn't a lie. It's a, it's a sort of deceptive gesture which keeps people from realizing how superior a man he is. And I suppose irony in this sense is a sort of mechanism of self-preservation. The people around him are unworthy of Socrates, and it's not just true of the people that lived in the same space and time with Socrates. After reading the dialogues, it's hard to come away with the feeling that we are worthy of him. It is hard to think that we can live up to these high ideals. In that respect, by showing us our ineptitude he show, and, our, and our viciousness, our incompleteness, he is playing a joke on us, saying, you came here looking for wisdom, and in fact, the only wisdom I can give you is that you have a lot longer to go. You have a long way to go. That's the best thing I could tell you. Socrates has hidden himself. Socrates, like God, is mysterious and enigmatic. And he seems to be playing some sort of joke with us based upon the idea that he has seen both realms and we are poor creatures of space and time. Perhaps that would make anyone melancholic. The longing for home, the longing for permanence, the longing for heaven, which all of us have some doubts about. Perhaps the internal jokes, the internal humor, the, what is hidden behind the mask is something angelic and divine. Well, Socrates has played his little game of irony and has been laughing up his sleeve all his career, as Alcibiades says. And Alcibiades, having taken on the voice of the god, we are assured is telling us the truth. And I'm fairly confident that if Socrates had not been ironic, he would have been killed much earlier in his career. Suppose Socrates had said, directly to the people of Athens, you're vicious and ignorant, and you should let me run the state immediately, and had completely refrained from, from hiding behind this ironic mask and from only talking to a few people. Suppose he had said, you're vicious and corrupt, and you deserve to lose the Peloponnesian War because you can't control yourselves, much less other people. You deserve these political catastrophes. Well, I think that he would have been killed as a treasonable, as an evil man, as a man who is in conflict with the good of the people around him. And of course, he would have been even more completely misunderstood then. So perhaps the irony here is the fact that instead of, uh, of hiding himself or concealing himself, in his irony, Socrates reveals as much of himself as we can possibly absorb. But there's no excess. And you become spiritually or mentally prepared for reading the dialogues as you purify yourself, as you move from a state of ignorance to a state of knowledge, as you read them several times, as you start to compare them across um, space and time, across the different parts of the dialogues, what you begin to get is a sort of spiritual journey of your own. You follow the path of Socrates from one idea to another, and then the irony begins to strip away. You never, I think, completely get rid of the layers of irony. It's like an onion. It has many layers to it. But as you study them and as you prepare your own soul, as you absorb the Socratic knowledge, the ironies, at least the immediate apparent surface ironies, begin to disappear. But I think the ironies never disappear completely. The final irony is, is that the irony only conceals as much as you conceal from yourself. It is a test of the soul. It is a mirror of the soul. Remember the Phaedrus, that good and loving rhetoric, rhetoric which tries to improve the beloved, constructs the identity and shows you who you are? I think that every person projects himself or herself into the Socratic dialogues. When you read them, you cannot but push your own agenda, your own sets of thoughts in there. Look at the great philosophers and what they have done, the tremendously disparate interpretations we have gotten of Socrates. Think of Nietzsche's spiteful and evil interpretation of Socrates. There's clearly a tremendous amount of envy here in Nietzsche's interpretation of Socrates' death scene. Think of Kierkegaard, his own melancholia comes out and he recognizes it in Socrates. And they are in some ways talking about different men because different parts of the mask have been taken off, depending on what you can bring to the dialogues. The dialogues are a test of your own spiritual resources. And as they increase, the amount of irony decreases, but perhaps the irony is infinite. So no matter, no matter how many ironic masks you remove, there's still a mask underneath. Socrates then is a standing challenge and a standing joke because he is the greatest of comic heroes. It's a joke that's too deep for us to plumb. We can't get to the bottom of this divine comedy. And 
Socrates tells us that much, that in so many words, in more than one occasion. The telos of his irony, the, the purpose of his irony, because remember that he's interested in teleology, he's interested in purpose of activity and purposes of, purpose of accounts of the external world, the telos of irony is education. And he educates us with this irony because irony is a, is a provocation. He points us in the right direction by making us feel foolish and stupid. I ought to be able to understand this book. I've been reading it for many years now, and alas, I do not. It also is a temptation. He says, I dare you to come and understand this. I dare you to get underneath my final mask. These ironies are intended to push us along, to goad us towards a deeper and richer and finer reading of the dialogues, which involves improving ourselves and increasing the stock of intellectual and spiritual resources we bring to the dialogues. What do we find out at the end? We find out how ignorant we are, how extensive the domain of our foolishness and vice is. And what that does for us is increase our consciousness. It increases our self-knowledge. As the Oracle at Delphi says, know thyself. Socrates is the man who is particularly good at knowing himself and the process by which his self-knowledge is extended to other people so that they might know themselves is continued not just in Socrates' lifetime but throughout the history of the dialogues. When we read the dialogues we find out about Socrates and Socrates offers us a chance to look at ourselves, to introspect and examine our own souls. And what do we find in our own souls? Viciousness, ignorance, insufficient and unsatisfactory spiritual resources. All this is protreptic. It is an exhortation, pushing us on the journey of the dialectic. We too must become new heroes of soul, new heroes of mind. Socrates offers us a heroism that we can emulate because we are ignorant, vicious, foolish people who are best off if we stop fooling ourselves. Knowledge, like charity, begins at home, begins within the soul. And if we're going to be nice to other people, we might just as well be nice to ourselves. Stop fooling ourselves. Stop kidding ourselves. Stop relaxing in intellectual slackness and intellectual vice. The point of Socrates is not the eternal questions, what is reality, what is being, that's foolishness, or the eternal answers. Nothing is more unsocratic than the idea of eternal answers. No, there's just the provisional answer that we'll accept for now, and if it turns out that we change our minds later for some good reason, that is the most Socratic thing, not being caught in this ossified dogma. If the theory of forms turns out to be unsatisfactory, the most Socratic thing in the world is to get rid of it. It would be easy to draw the wrong inference from what I said about Plato's doubts about the theory of forms later on in his career. Socrates perhaps gave up the theory of forms or perhaps never even had the theory of forms. Who knows and who cares? Socrates is not, is not the purveyor of a set of dogmas, a finished set of conclusions. He is showing us how to ask questions of other people and also of ourselves. And we must be sure that as we ask these questions, as we embark upon this Pythagorean spiritual journey, as we fo uh, follow in the footsteps of Socrates insofar as we can, we not be overtaken with the solemnity of the, uh, of the occasion. We should not get the misapprehension that we are really important and that we are really significant. In fact, self-importance is the opposite of Socratic un self-understanding. In fact, your importance lies in the fact that you are on the spiritual journey, and it's not the destination, it's the process of getting where you're going. The gods love a joke, and Socrates is a joke that has been played upon us by the gods. Perhaps this whole human world, this all of human life, is that kind of a joke. And there's a wonderful passage in the Cratylus, a dialogue that I didn't do, that exemplifies this in a beautiful way. I want to read it to you because it is very funny. And you could easily pass over this and not understand that this is intended as a joke. This is a Cratylus, section 406b. Um, his interlocutor asks, what is the meaning of Dionysus and Aphrodite? Now remember what the symbolism is here. Dionysus, drunkenness, excess, art, emotion, and Aphrodite, the human sex drive. So in other words, what is the significance of our emotions? In other words, asking the great sage, what does our bronze part, the part which dominates in almost all of us almost all the time, what does it mean, Socrates? And Socrates says, Son of Hipponicus, 
you ask a solemn question. There is a serious and also a facetious explanation for both of these names. The serious explanation is not to be had from me, but there is no objection to your hearing a facetious one, for the gods too love a joke. <laughs> the disorganized state of our emotional life, the fact that we are not in control of Dionysus and Aphrodite, is a joke played upon us by the gods. And to think that there is some solemn answer that we can get from Socrates about these things is a joke we play on ourselves. In fact, Socrates says, look, a facetious answer is not no answer. And even though we don't achieve any final wisdom in the Socratic dialogues, he teaches us that we should not take ourselves or this project too seriously. And if the project of self-knowledge, if the project of the Socratic dialectic is not a thing to be taken seriously, surely things like political power and wealth and pleasure are even less noble, even less worthy. And certainly the people that take them seriously are the ones who are even worse off than the ones who take knowledge seriously. There perhaps is nothing in human life which we should take with grim seriousness. Only God, only the divinity is truly serious. So if you are caught up in some kind of jumble, if you are in an emotional tangle, if you are in an emotional or a, a, a personal tangle with other people, be quiet, relax, and reflect. You may think that you are in a jam. You may think that all these things are important. This is the world of illusion. And the biggest illusion that we carry with us is the fact that we are important and all the projects we have decided to engage in are important. Relax, step back, take a deep breath, and inquire into yourself. Pursue your own knowledge of yourself. It is far more important than anything you will get from the external world. This is an important part of the Socratic legacy. Now, jokes like this are extremely serious. Socrates is a serious joke. Again, do not make the mistake of thinking that playfulness and seriousness are incompatible. Alas, they, not. they are not. He has been playing jokes on us all through, and he's just pointing out to us that we have been playing jokes on ourselves. And perhaps we will finally achieve a sort of Socratic sense of humor when we start to play jokes not on ourselves, but on other people. The kind of beneficial, morally improving jokes that, invo that are involved in teaching other people what they are and in showing other people how, if not to gain virtue, how to move towards virtue, how to open their mind and liberate their souls. Now, how do we get down to the bottom of this? Is there any bottom of this, or is this just an infinite regress of larger and larger and more profound philosophical jokes? And I think that, I don't know if we can get to the bottom, but we can move asymptotically towards it. The jokes in the dialogues tease us. They say, look, you're foolish enough to have taken this seriously the last time you read it, but now you underline it in a different color because you realize that this is ironic rather than true. The irony, the flip-flop between stating something and stating the opposite, teases us, provokes us because of the thread it has, it offers us to our self-conception, to our, our, our understanding of ourselves as being vessels of self-contained wisdom, he punctures those vessels and says, look, you aren't even close to what you think you are. Your self-conception is flawed. And this forces us, this enigmatic kind of irony, forces us to ask defensive questions of the dialogues. And what's most remarkable and miraculous about these dialogues is that when we ask them the right questions, they answer. The dialogues speak to us. The dialogues are a mimesis, a representation of the living voice. That's what's immortal about Socrates and immortal about the, the dialogues. They represent the immediate articulation of persistent human problems, persistent human questions. And that's why they never get out of style. The questions may change, but the changes are minor compared to the fact that the idea of questioning at all, at all, the idea of pursuing knowledge of yourself and by implication knowledge of other people, that's what's permanent in Socrates. He is the image of the inquirer. Now, I don't know what the final joke of the dialogues is, but let me give you a, a shot at it or do the best I can with it at the risk of making myself kind of foolish, the risk of making a joke of myself. I think the biggest joke in the dialogues is that they don't teach you anything. I read this big fat book many times. Some of these dialogues I've read 30, 40, 50 times, something like The Republic. And at the end of all this reading, I spent years reading this stuff, you don't learn anything. It is arguably the most profound philosophy ever constructed. It is arguably 
the deepest and most enigmatic set of poetic, logical images brought together in one unique kind of an art form. And after reading it, what do you find out? Keep thinking. Keep thinking, and it's like a carrot and stick. You take another step along the road of dialectic, and do you get the carrot? You never get the carrot. You never get to the form of knowledge, the form of the good. Think about Glaucon climbing up out of the cave with Socrates. He says, Socrates, what is the form of the good? And Socrates says, sorry, this is where the journey of dialectic ends. Now you've got to take it on your own, kid. What? In some ways, it's a real sad irony, but on the other hand, perhaps he's just saying that language is asymptotic. Human life never achieves the divine. It is outside our capacities altogether. There is, strictly speaking, no Socratic dogma. There is no set of conclusions that allows you to be a Socratic. If you look at the whole history of the criticism of the Socratic dialogues, the philosophers project a great deal more of themselves into their interpretation of this than they pull out. If you were to um, if you were from a completely alien culture, from Mars, for example, and came down and looked at the various interpretations of Socrates throughout the 25th century history since Socrates was alive, you would almost guess that they were different people. Nietzsche's interpretation has nothing to do with the interpretations offered by the Neoplatonists. And the Neoplatonist conception of Socrates is very different from that of Kierkegaard. We only get out of the dialogues what we bring in. And that, in some ways, is a standing joke played on us. It is a, a huge practical joke, but it is also an intellectual joke, and it is a joke, strangely enough, with, which benefits us. Socrates, then, is the greatest of the philosophical jokers. I would say that the Platonic dialogues are one huge comedy, a, com a human comedy which gestures at the divine, but never brings us to it. Um, it's like Moses, who can see the promised land, but never actually gets to enter it. He gives us some vague and fuzzy conception of what real divine final knowledge would be like, but the joke is on us. We shall not reach it. We can only move in the direction of it. Even more ironic, and perhaps even more comic in a kind of deep and philosophical sense, is that not only is there no Socratic dogmas, or are there no Socratic dogmas, but there is no Socratic book. Socrates, like all the great spiritual teachers of mankind, never wrote a book. The Buddha never wrote a book. Confucius never wrote a book. Uh, uh, any of the great spiritual teachers were beyond writing. Right? If you look at any, uh, at any of the great spiritual teachers of mankind, they did not want to fix their thought in a book. In the Phaedrus, specifically, when Socrates talks about rhetoric, he says explicitly, I don't trust writ the written word. Only the living word really does the job, because you can't ask questions of a book. Plato can't talk directly back to us. The best we can do is reconstruct what he might or might not have meant, what he might or might not have thought, based upon these dead words. And that is one reason why the Platonic dialogues are an elaborate joke played upon us. Socrates never wrote a book, and after reading hundreds or even thousands of pages of Socratic dialogue, you don't know what, Socr what Socrates thinks, and you don't know what sense ultimately to make out of this. Socrates is a persistent enigma, a joke played on us. He's the universal straight man. He's a superior kind of comic hero where we're the ridiculous, foolish people. And what is ridiculous and foolish about us, I, I think he talks about uh, this in the Philebus, one of the later dialogues where he talks about pleasure. He says that comedy involves people that don't know themselves, foolish, ridiculous people that, because of their lack of self-knowledge and their lack of self-understanding, make the kind of mistakes that are human all too human. What we'll find is that the Socratic dialogues point away from themselves. They don't point towards the external world. They don't to point towards space and time. They don't point towards the gratification of our senses or our desires. What they point towards is the living voice. Socrates is the image of our desire for communication. Socrates is the great icon, the great hero of connection, social, loving connection to other people. And we cannot make that connection with other people by reading great books of philosophy. Socrates himself didn't write any books. No, Socrates is using his dialogic method to 
push us towards communication because it's the, this communication, this connection with other people that refines us, that improves us, and if it does not perfect us, it is not the fault of the dialogue, it is not the fault of the living voice, the fault is our own. Uh, you might want to say that Socrates is the word made flesh. He is the image of the divinity. And this divinity somehow is what connects these individual little egos that we are, trapped in these individual little bodies that we are. He shows us how to be something bigger, more permanent, more divine, and more perfect than we are. So, what's the joke here? Well, there are many layers to the joke. First joke is that this is not Socrates. This is a mimesis, a representation of Socrates made by Plato. Socrates himself didn't believe in the written word. And Plato also says that he doesn't believe in the written word, oddly enough. He says, the best I could do to be true to the uh, memory and to the spirit of Socrates is to write the Socratic dialogues. But in the seventh letter, one of Plato's personal writings, um, he says explicitly that I have never written any, any Socratic dogmas down, or I've never written any, the real doctrine down. You can't write the real doctrine down. In other words, this is just a representation, like a photograph or a painting of an activity. It is not the activity itself. Do not make the mistake of thinking that Platonism or Socratic philosophy is to be found in this book. This is just a gesture at that Socratic life, and that Socratic life is bound up with the living word. You cannot learn, ironically enough, you cannot learn Socratic philosophy from Plato. You can't learn anything from a book. You are, learn by inquiring, by taking part in the living encounter with your own perplexity. And what this necessarily forces you to do is to become a social animal, to make a bridge towards other people. This is why the Phaedrus and the Symposium are so important. It is the living word, this drive towards communication, that makes us fully human, that pulls us out of the miserable, wretched shoals of our own egoism. It allows us to embark on an ocean of speech. And this ocean of speech is where we really belong. We can't completely navigate it. We will never complete our journey. Socrates never got final wisdom. He couldn't tell us what the realm of the forms is. But the journey itself is what makes our life blessed and worthwhile. The ir irony, then, is that you can't learn Socratic philosophy through this mimesis. The best we can do is treat this as an exhortation towards living the examined life, towards facing squarely our ignorance and our depravity and doing whatever we can to force ourselves towards some higher, finer, better state. Now there's another joke that doesn't come from Plato or from Socrates connected with all this. And this is me. This is my joke. And alas, the joke is here and I haven't been able to get around it. I would if I could. I would give you serious lectures if I could, but I don't know how. And here's the problem. Back at home, wherever you are, you are either listening to this on audio tape or you are watching this on television. And I am not a set of dots on your television screen. I am not this array of lights. I am not this, these sounds coming out of your stereo speakers. In fact, I'm a person somewhere else. What you have in front of you with these audio tapes or with these videotapes is a representation. It is a mimesis. And that means that I am rather far down on the divided line with all the other images and shadows and poetic constructs. You thought that I was going to teach you Socrates and Plato. You thought that you were going to find out about this stuff from me. Well, I have a joke for you. First of all, there's nothing to find out. And second of all, even if there were something to find out, I couldn't tell it to you. The best I can do is what Plato did, is to construct a representation of Plato's representation of Socrates doing what Socrates did. So in other words, if there were another notch on the divided line below the poets, below Platonic art, well, I would be down there. Right? So first of all, do not mistake this array of dots on your television screen for being Mike Segrew. I'm not an array of dots. Take my word for it. Not only that, do not mistake my lectures for Platonism. They're not. Platonism is to be found in the book. If you want to know about Plato, read his book. There is no substitute for that. In other words, there's no royal road to knowledge. Much as I like the idea of giving lectures on audio and videotape, there is no way to get around the fact that you must do your reading. You will never know this stuff. You will never taste these wonderful experiences if you are not willing to look at the book itself. You must apply yourself. You must pay your dues. I've paid my dues.
I've read the book and I found something that gives me the highest and finest incentive towards an examined life. You must do the same. I cannot do this for you. The joke goes further. Once you've done that and paid your dues and spent many hours and hopefully many pleasant hours reading the Socratic dialogues, reading what Plato has to say about his master Socrates and also about the other interlocutors that he has, even then, all you have is a poetic mimesis, the bottom of the divided line. So I'm going to try and help you or exhort you or explain to you how to climb the ladder of beauty. Remember in the symposium, we move from the beauty of physical objects, the beauty of bodies, to the beauty of thoughts, to the beauty of souls, and then from there to the beauty of the forms themselves. The best I can do is to is to exhort you, to tell you to climb that ladder, but I cannot climb the ladder for you. The best that we can do then, ironically, with this, seri with this collection of philosophical jokes, is for me to give you some things to think about, some things to work over in your brain as you read the dialogues, or before you read the dialogues, or after you read the dialogues. And each of these speeches each of these lectures and each of these dialogues is a step on that journey of dialectic towards self-knowledge. But alas, do not, do not mistake the shadow for the thing. Do not mistake these sounds coming out of your stereo speakers for a lecture on Plato. In fact, it's a representation of a lecture, and my lecture is a representation of Plato's dialogues, and the dialogues are a representation of Socrates. Socrates is a long way off. You cannot become a new Socrates. We cannot live the life of the, which imitates Socrates in the same way that perhaps Christians wish to imitate Christ or Buddhists wish to imitate the Buddha. Socrates is a peculiar thing. He has the daimon in his brain. He is obviously a divine creature of a very unique caste. The best we can do is to approximate the Socratic path and move on it as far as we possibly can. The path is endless, but the point is not the destination, but the journey. What is good for our souls, what will refine us and humanize us, make us better than we are, if not perfect, is the willingness to exert yourself in engaging the living human voice. So to finish off these set of ironies, this lack of my, my, my lack of ability to show you what Socrates really means, my point is this. These, these lectures will probably do you some good, give you something to think about and allow you to, to, to look at some themes that you may not have seen in your first reading of the dialogues. God knows I've, met, I've read them many times. After you go to the dialogues, you read them, you think them over, but your project doesn't end there. Socrates shows us that you cannot study philosophy without your friends. You must have philosophical friends. You cannot be a hermit. You cannot simply go to a cave with the Platonic Dialogues and live the Socratic life. If you could do that, Socrates would have done it. He would have gone to some mountaintop. He stayed in the city. He was a creature of the polis because it's only in the city among living human beings that Socrates could find the living voice. What Socrates offers to us is the chance to get out beyond the limits of our ego, to participate in something larger, the logos. And you can't participate in the logos, which means both speech and reason and argument, by yourself. You cannot talk to yourself. You cannot simply listen to the mimesis of me on your stereo or on your TV and think that you can have a dialogue with me. I can't answer your questions. I would if I could, but I cannot. So this mimesis is a protreptic. We're trying to push you towards the dialogues, and the dialogues are trying to push you towards Socrates, and Socrates is trying to push you towards the living voice. Become human. Allow your mind to inquire into all things. And do not think it impious if you reach different conclusions from Socrates. That is not the, the, the overthrow of Socratic philosophy. That is the culmination of Socratic philosophy. If it turns out that you don't like Plato's theory of forms, get rid of it. Plato isn't worried and neither is Socrates. If it turns out you don't like Plato's conception of nature, get rid of it. Talk the problem out with your philosophical friends. Come up with a better, higher, finer idea. And that is the culmination of Socratic philosophy that does not undermine Socratic philosophy. It's because of the fact that Socrates represents the living voice, that Socrates will never be superseded. And the best a teacher can do is to drive you towards the dialogues. The best the dialogues can do is to drive you towards the human voice. And the best the human voice can do is to drive you towards knowledge of yourself by 
creating self-knowledge in other people. And we only do this linguistically, as Socrates showed us in the Phaedrus, the self is constructed in language, in the loving struggle to create intelligibility, to create order, to create uh, a construction of the soul in which all the parts are doing what they ought to do. This goes back to teleological explanation. Think about what the parts of you are, how your desire relates to your reason, how the better part of your nature should take control of the worse, the ungainly, the, the disorganized. Socrates offers us the drive to perfection. And this drive to perfection is a loving, wonderful, serious struggle, but this seriousness does, never degenerates into self um, into self-importance. It is a solemnity which is joyous rather than luxurious. Socrates points out in the laws, what's the section, I'll read it to you, that if we are really going to follow the Socratic life, we have to realize that this veil of Maya around us is none too important, and we have no choice but to live in it. But the best we can do is to organize our soul with our, in relation to it. And once we organize our chaos within, we can begin to organize the chaos without. I will leave you on the following thought, which is taken from the laws, section 803b. It's a kind of parting shot from Socrates, which shows the combination of seriousness and comedy, which is characteristic of the dialogues, this resolution of opposites. The, the anonymous Athenian, the Athenian stranger of the laws says, To be sure, man's life is a business which does not deserve to be taken too seriously. Yet we cannot help being in earnest about it. And there's the pity. Why, I mean we should keep our seriousness for serious things and not waste it on trifles. And that while God is the real goal of all beneficent, serious endeavor, man, as we said before, has been constructed as a toy for God. And this is, in fact, the finest thing about him. All of us, then, men and women alike, must fall in with our role and spend life in making our play as perfect as possible. Go play with the dialogues. This is the best advice I can give you. Thank you. <clears throat> wow. Uh, I really like that. <clears throat> the last 10 minutes is just spot on. <clears throat> Um, I wonder what happened to him. I would love to have a conversation with him. I don't know if he would, but who knows? The The point is the attempt. I mean, when he says the words, uh, the veil of Maya, <laughs> it's like, all right, I know, I know where this guy is, at least where he's at at that point. And this is probably in the, it's in the nineties. It's crazy how long ago it was. Um, but uh, I just want to see how far <laughs> he's gotten um, since then. And just, it's, whew. you know, that's the, the point. It's kind of why I've been wanting these conversations, wanting to reach out with other individuals and, and just talk about certain things uh, that's more more important. Not so trivial, I guess. And, and if we are talking about the trivial stuff, at least have a good time with it. Which most of the time we do, if I am talking with others. And um, it seems harder and harder to do that. I mean, um, some people are busy. Some people have their own agendas and some people just truly do want to talk with somebody about certain things. And I'm all for that. And I think that's what we need to do a lot more often. The thing is when you don't do that, well, what you're going to have with same thing with, um, how, uh, sophists and sophistry and John Adams said it best. Um, there's a, <laughs> Quote of the day, which is the previous video, and I'm going to have to find it, aren't I? Uh, let's see. Give me a second here. And here we go. His quote was abusive words has been the great instrument of sophistry and chicanery 
of party, faction, and division of society. Right? One person believes something that makes a lot of other people believe in it too. Doesn't necessarily mean it's the truth or not. You know, it just he, that person, he or she, can get the majority to to agree. And that's where we have all these parties, all these factions, all these divisions within our society. But you take that individual out of that party. You take that individual out of that faction. You take that individual out of that divisive um, portion of, of uh, whatever it is. And get talking about something else, the big picture. What, what, what are they doing? Why are they doing it? What, what is it all for? What does it mean to them? Is it something that's important to them um individually maybe it's important to their family members whether they have children or maybe they have a spouse or they have parents or grandparents who whatever that are affected by it maybe they don't have anyone but what what's their why are they doing the things that they are doing and why are they taking the side of the side that they are at, on and um who is it that's pretty much doing all the things that the problems are and then you know it's kind of like um let's break it down okay and just like wh whenever whether i want to talk to anyone about the situation with with government or religion or the shape of the earth whatever come on in we can talk about it let's break it down you know my my point is just uh looking at it from the standpoint of the official narrative and let's i'm gonna explore the contradictions within the official narrative what are you going to be looking at where how are you going to look at it with within the the context of the frame i mean uh most of the time i would i would guess that uh the people who would who are watching well i guess uh, most some of the people who are watching would probably be mostly agree agreeing with me but I would also say that some of the people that do watch will still disagree with me and take the stance of the the control system, the control mechanism, whatever it is, the establishment. All these other things, they'll, they'll agree with me on something about how, yeah, 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 we know that these systems lie, these systems are in it for their own vices, they're, they're in it for money, they're in it for power, they're in it for whatever. Oh, but this thing, no, 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 that's legitimate. You know, they're looking out for us. Especially, you know, they may not be looking out for us here or here or here or here, but right there. Oh, yeah, that one. They're looking out for us. The other ones, no. Oh, wait, that one they are. And when I, I can break it down and say, okay, um, why, why aren't they looking out for us in this instance? Why aren't they looking out for us in, in that one? And so what makes you think that they are looking out for us in this instance? If, if those if those other parts, you know, <laughs> they're, they're going to go ahead and, and want to kill us slowly, you know, why why even tell us anything type of thing? Or if they want to steal from us, why, why would they want to tell us the truth about anything? I mean, if they're going to just get us to pay for it with lies, what's the use? What's the point of telling us the truth? um so yeah i mean i would love that's why i have a zoom thing where people can join um but again uh people don't um zoom link is right there and most of the time it's just me talking to myself sometimes i wonder if i should uh, i don't know, talk to strangers <laughs> i don't know I mean, most of y'all are strangers, right? We I, we don't know each other, so it's the same thing. Going out and talking to a person out in the street, but it'd be a little bit weird. Uh, just talking about anything. Hey, let's just talk about anything. Let me let me know your thoughts. Let's let's have a philosophical conversation. <laughs> maybe I need to join a philosophical club or something like that. But then again, maybe the philosoph the people who are uh, in that club aren't really philosophers. Maybe they're sophists, and they're like or nihilist or something like that or hedonist <laughs> it's like well um okay i guess we're i'm not gonna learn anything here 
<laughs> so we pretty much have to find people who are looking for this for the truth. And again, the idea is the opposite of the sophists. We are looking for the truth. To to find the truth, we're gonna have to search for it. We're gonna have to really, really check everywhere. Uh, and then when we do find it, well, we're gonna realize, ha, huh, it's it was kind of there all along. It was so simple. And um, it's like, wow, I couldn't, why couldn't we have thought of that? And that's kind of how he talks about how he can't climb that ladder for you, right? So he can point you to the ladder and say, hey, climb up there. You can, you know, this is, see what you can see. And same thing with me and ayahuasca. Like, I can I can explain to you what happened, what, how it kind of kind of symbolically is represented from what my conscious experience uh, of that weird otherworldly experience of consciousness. Um, but what makes sense to you? All I have to say is do it, <laughs> try it, experience it for yourself. And I think you're going to find the similarities um, intriguing. You're going to be like, man, it's so simple. Why don't, I don't, how does, I mean, it's so simple. <laughs> you're just going to be laughing. He's like, yeah, 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 I get it. Yeah, I know. Now what do we do? It's like, well, we got to get everyone else. <laughs> we we, we got to get everybody else. I mean, uh, some people are like, no, 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 we're going to go on our own. But, um, but yeah, I think, uh, that, I think that's what's the, another good part about it is, uh, uh the professor Sugru states that we can't do it alone. Um, that, that is true. But when you also look back on all the spiritual prophets, um, the leaders and what whatnot, whether it's Socrates or Jesus or Buddha or Muhammad, whoever, um, a majority of them, maybe even you know Dionysus and all the Greek gods and all this other stuff, they never wrote anything down. They never wrote their own books. You would think that they would. I mean, they're the most enlightened of us all. You'd think they would go, hey, here, follow this and, um, you know, we're good <laughs> or you're good or whatever. It's like it would make things so much easier. Hey, these guys had just kind of figured it all out. Why don't, they, why don't they just provide that for us? Why don't they make things a lot easier? I mean, the point isn't to make it easier. <laughs> the point is to keep it difficult. Um, so that's, that's just an interesting viewpoint that I, I never even thought about. It's like, Hey, that's right. All the accounts of all these spiritual enlightened individuals in the past, all the accounts from them that survived over these centuries is that, uh, is that of secondhand accounts? It's like, I mean, I'm. Some of them are, are pretty smart. Hey, they better be smart. They're supposed to be godlike, you know, at least above our the humans here or whatever. It's like, and all of them, of course, most of them. I, I think, with the exception of Buddha, uh, who knows? It seems like uh, the m motif has always been they've been killed by us. <laughs> They never died on like their own bed, you know. They've always been um, screwed over by us humans. We killed them. <laughs> Every one of, of the better of one of us <laughs> have always been killed by by humans, the worst of us. And uh, it feels like that's something that will never change, right? I mean, all, a lot of this has been going on for, if the history is correct in, in all that stuff. Thousands of years, thousands of years, we haven't seen any others. And if there have been, they've probably been killed off. <laughs> and everyone, everyone's like, 
eyes closed, hands over ears, like, ah, whatever, you know, I believe in this. That's all I need. And the ones that they, whatever that they believe in, the ones orchestrating or at the head of it, they're probably the ones who are the ones killing all these <laughs> best of us people. They want, they want what they want. They want, they want recompense. They want to be compensated. They want to have the power. They want people to have, they want followers. I mean, hasn't that always been the case? Every religion, followers. We want, we need followers. Every, every, even the spiritual leaders, we need flower, followers, 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 followers. But where are they going? Where are you taking them? I mean, um, uh, let's take Jesus Christ, for example, in the New Testament and whatnot. It's like, follow me. Where are we going? Um, we're just going to move around. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, is there a point to all this moving around? I'm going to show you how to be fishers of men. What does that mean? Just have them follow us? And, yeah, yeah, I guess. Why didn't you say that instead of fishers of men? It's like, what about women? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's just, I mean, if you're there, I mean, imagine at that point, you know, you're at that spot. You're just, I'm just fishing. Jesus Christ goes, come on, I'm gonna make you a fisher of men. It's like, well, can I catch a fish first? It's, it's like it's like okay this is the last chance it's like i'm like all right <laughs> have a good one <laughs> i mean something's gotta happen it's like here here you want to see magic trick and I go, okay is that why you want me to follow you so i could learn magic tricks like, no, 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 but this is a good one <laughs> i mean i i think probably the the point is um with the dialogues and stuff is to put yourself into that situation, right? And what you would do <laughs> and when you'd be looking around and go, why are you clapping? That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Why are you clapping? <laughs> it's like, oh my goodness. Uh, and then uh, I'd be like, dude, you guys are idiots. Why are you clapping at that? He just made fun of you. And everyone in the audience is like, huh? You made fun of us? What are you talking about? Stone him! I'm like, all right, I'll just shut up and run away and not get stoned. That's what it feels like today, too, doesn't it? It's like, wow, wow, I can't say anything these days. <laughs> so I, I, hey, that, that, that guy's been, that fella or that gal, whatever, they've been accused of sexual harassment. Plenty of times. Why are you still liking and following that guy or girl? I'm like, yeah, it's entertaining. It's like, seems like he seems nice or she seems nice, you know? It's like, yeah, I think there's just been a lot of following. Uh, not enough of people just kind of figuring things out on their own. And uh, that's that's always just been the case, right? But yeah, I am uh, bored of talking to myself, which is basically you guys seeing me talking to myself, but talking to you, although I don't know who you are. <laughs> um, and yeah, y'all are going to just keep watching uh, mostly people that uh, you don't like. Um, instead of stopping watching, instead of watching people you don't like. Or you know there are people who are uh, who aren't really honest. Um, why don't you find something out there uh, where you can watch what you like and listen to someone where you can be, you know that they are honest. Um, doesn't have to be me. I know I'm not entertaining enough, but it could be something out there. I mean, hey, read the di dialogues or something like that. Um, listen to this guy. He's got like 12 hours of audio. Um, Michael Sugru, the professor. Uh, I mean, there's plenty out there uh, that you can you can watch and listen to where you can gain something where you, your thoughts are a little bit different. But at least, you know, it's it's you're thinking for yourself. You're thinking um, putting your your yourself in that place even though it's just imaginary but at least you know you could just picture it and go wow yeah that's i mean everything just seems so serious 
<laughs> like, I, you know, I don't think I'm that serious. I'd probably, I mean, put them in a crowd out there, like on the streets of uh, any city, you know. Just I mean, That's why I think what's so funny and great about... Um, <laughs> who were those guys? Um, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Right, they go back in time. They bring back a lot of famous people. They come back, and it's just the present time, and just how they react, and with the people of, of, of the current times, and and they're just and people are like, "Hey, you idiots!" <laughs> Look, they'll say that to Socrates or whatever, and you know, it, it's just it's just hilarious. It is, but um, in the context of a lot of things, a lot of written works and fiction movies. You know, it's it's always such a serious situation. Well, but when you think about it, when you put all those spiritual leaders together in a room, you know, what would they talk about? You know, Professor um, Sagru talks about how uh, Socrates, when when he dies, he, you know, he's saying, yeah, that's going to be okay. When, when I go, when after I'm dead, you know, maybe I'll get to a better place where... Uh, there's better people and that we can talk about all the things we want to talk about. You know, it's the same thing with like people who believe that they're going to, after they die, they're going to be, they're going to go to heaven. And it's like, all right, what's heaven like? What would they, what would there be in heaven? <laughs> you know, that's what I want to know. It's like, I want to know what the conversations Socrates would have with Jesus and Buddha and, and everyone else who made it up there. It's like, do they talk about the, the ball games down here? It's like, you know, all this talk and all this stuff about finding what's here and now that we're here is like, can someone just turn on TV? I want to watch the Brewers game. I'm like, damn, Brewers. Who are the Brewers? Do they still exist? <sighs> Anyways, that's it for tonight. Are you not entertained? Well, go entertain yourself. Good night.